So first of all, welcome to all of you for today's webinar. I am Vijeta Raghura, Program Manager Education from India Bioscience. A few days ago, I had uh, sent out an email um, to all of you uh, to tell us what comes to your mind when you think of the word bioethics. And uh, most of you uh, have uh, participated and thanks to all who did. And uh, as you can see, we've got a range of responses and in today's uh, webinar we hope that we will get to delve deeper into the concept of bioethics especially in biomedical research and the ultimate goal of this webinar is not so much to leave you with uh, say five or ten rules that you must follow but it is more to highlight the biases that influence science practice the kind of dilemmas that may occur and how discussions can then shape the policies related to bioethics. Today's speaker is Dr. Savita Meghanathan, who is a senior scientist and uh, the community engagement program lead at Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, which is again a part of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. And her areas of interest is in bioethics and science communication in general. So uh, welcome to you, Savita. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Savita, please uh, begin your presentation. It's over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Vijeta. Thank you, Shantala and uh, India Bioscience team for having me here. Um, and thank you, audience, for joining uh, today. Um, yeah, let's start. Here we go. So uh, today I wanted to talk about bioethics in the Indian context. And also this is very close to my heart because my PhD work was around uh, bioethics and even my postdoctoral work was also around bioethics. Uh, so uh, let's see how much we can cover today and uh, also, uh, as uh, Vijeta rightly pointed out, uh, I'm not I'm not going to tell you you know follow five or six policies or you know uh, these are the guidelines to be followed. Uh, it's more of a deliberation and also. Uh, I'm going to leave you with some stories, uh, you know, for you to think through and you know then arrive at your own conclusions. So, what is bioethics? Uh, ethics aims to figure out what is the right thing to do or what is the best course of action. It helps people to decide how to behave and how to treat one another and what values should prevail. So usually we like to be treated well and uh, this, the same is expected of us as researchers, right? And bioethics is the study of ethical, social and legal issues that arise in life sciences, biomedicine, biomedical research and science policy. And it is also very interdisciplinary because it has a lot of philosophy in it, sociology, medical anthropology. So it's not very limited uh, you know, field of study. And um, identification, study and resolution or mitigation of conflicts among competing values or goals are the key aspects of the practice of bioethics. So these are a little bit theoretical, but we'll, we'll try to understand all of these things through case studies. And we also have medical ethics, which focuses on issues in healthcare. Then we have research ethics, which focuses issues on the conduct of research. Environment ethics, which focuses on issues pertaining to the relationship between uh, human activities and environment and public health ethics addresses ethical issues in public health. So all of this comes under the gamut of bioethics. Um, many complex human challenges that we face today, uh, we think that they can be solved using innovation and science and uh, research is the crux of it. Uh, it can be noted that bioethics came into uh, this kind of an articulation probably in 1960s and um, uh, it's very interdisciplinary. So it also addresses issues like, you know, abuses and experimentation on human subjects, availability of new biomedical technologies, opening up new pathways in diagnosis and therapeutics, the challenges of prevalent medical paradigms and the ultimate meaning and purpose of medical care. So uh, for the southern countries, especially like, you know, uh, countries like India, countries which were ruled or have, a, have an experience of a colonial past, 
some of our biomedical uh, education has that sort of a, a colonial uh, bearing to it. So uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about it a little later. Uh, new scientific and social fields of concern dealing with ecology and environmental health, genetic engineering and biotechnologies, demographics, behavioral man manipulation, uh, reproductive medicine. Now you have artificial intelligence as well. The upsurge of social movements raising issues of medical practices, uh, which we've seen quite a lot in India. And all of these social movements uh, post a public health research or a program uh, may have resulted in a public interest litigation filed in a court of law. And therefore, you know, uh, recourse would have been sought through those PILs. Then the need for ethics uh, for the new technological emergence, especially the new gene uh, technologies. Moving on, uh, let's look at this hallmark case, uh, the Nuremberg trial. Uh, so the, what it is, you know, uh, post the Second World War, uh, we had the Nuremberg trial. Uh, there was a tribunal in 1946 and the Nuremberg court came about in 1947. So I'll just give you, I'll just try to uh, tell you the story behind this. Uh, the Nuremberg Code is a set of ethical research principles uh, which was developed in the wake of Nazi uh, atrocities, specifically the inhumane and often uh, fatal experimentation on human subjects without consent during the World War II. The Nuremberg Code was created in 1947 in Nuremberg, Germany, following the trial of a group of Nazi doc doctors uh, accused of conducting inhuman and often deadly experiments on prisoners of concentration camps without their consent. At the conclusion of what's also referred to as the doctor's trial, about 16 people were found guilty. The Nuremberg uh, Code was developed in response to the horrors of this experimentation with the aim of protecting human subjects in medical research. The code uh, and particularly its emphasis on informed consent, uh, which also actually they articulated it as a voluntary consent, has had a profound impact on international human rights law and medical ethics. The Nuremberg Code consists of 10 principles, the first of which being that voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential in any experiment on humans. Other principles include that the experiment should be for the good of the society, that all unnecessary physical and mental suffering or injury should be avoided, and no experiment should be conducted if there is good reason to believe it may result in death or a disabling injury. They also say that the human subject should be free to exit the experiment at any given point in time if they are suffering, uh, and the scientist in charge uh, must also you know, be prepared to end the experiment itself if they have a good reason to believe that it may cause injury, disability, or death to the subject if it continued. Um, so the Nuremberg Code of 1947 also recognized the need and legitimacy of medical experimentation on human beings. Uh, and it, it highlighted voluntary consent, and it also paved the way for the Helsinki Declaration of 1964. Um, so moving on, another hallmark case study is the Tuskegee syphilis experiments of 1932 to 72. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit. So the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was again a clinical study conducted between 1932 and 72, which is about like almost uh, 40 years in Tuskegee, Alabama by the United States Public Health Service. 400 Afro-American sharecroppers, actually I think 399 of them, uh, most of them were illiterate, were studied to observe the natural progression of untreated syphilis up to their eventual death by the disease. This experiment aroused controversy and led to changes in the legal protection of the patients involved in the clinical studies Subjects involved in this experiment did not give their informed consent. They were not informed of their diagnosis that they had syphilis and were told that they were being treated for black, bad blood. They were also told that if they participated in the study, they would be given medi free medical care, free transportation to the clinic, free meals and free burial uh, insurance in, the, in case of death. And subjects were also warned to avoid penicillin treatment, which was already in use for the treatment of syphilis at that point in time. In 1932, when the study began, treatments for syphilis were very toxic, dangerous, and had questionable effectiveness. 
Part of the purpose of the study was to determine if the benefits of the treatment compensated its toxicity and to recognize the different stages of the disease uh, to develop treatments adapted to each of those stages. Doctors recruited, uh, as I said, 399 black men supposedly infected with syphilis, and uh, they studied the progress of the disease for the next 40 years. And uh, as a result of all of this, a control group of uh, 201 healthy men uh, were also studied to establish comparisons. Um, and uh, about um, uh, the continue uh, the study continued till 1972 and uh, it was until it was leaked to the press uh, that there were about 28 of these 399 patients uh, who had died of syphilis because they were not treated and uh, another 100 from related medical complications in addition 40 patients wives were infected uh, because the disease was untreated in their partners and about 19 children contracted the disease when being born uh, so this study led to, uh, you know, the set, uh, setting up of institutional review boards across the uh, United States and also the National uh, Human Investigation Board. Um, and also this is a hallmark study which indicates why a certain population, uh, you know, have a very, uh, they, they do not trust research, medical research, because, you know, they have already had the, uh, the history of being experimented upon. And uh, the study also led to the Belmont report of 1979. So this is not very far away. It's not 100 years back. So um, I would like to now introduce this concept called ethics dumping. So now we had these two case studies, you know, to understand the global implications of uh, how certain experiments were conducted and, uh, you know, how it led to some landmark uh, codes and uh, uh, boards being set up and reports being published. Uh, also, I would like to say that when we talk about India, it's not that only in India we have people, you know, doing, uh, have, you know, researchers not uh, following ethical protocols or, uh, uh, you know, violating the pro uh, standard operating uh, pr protocols. Uh, it's also, we, we have to keep in mind that this is something, you know, globally uh, shared. This burden is globally shared. And um, ethics dumping is one such concept where uh, the exploitative, you know, it, it elaborates on the exploitative North-South research collaborations. And this resonates, you know, colonial times where um, a certain group of developed countries who have higher uh, sophisticated research uh, access, um, uh, funding, uh, and also capacities, um, do research in the southern countries and when you know there are adverse events they they move out of the southern countries leaving behind the remnants of the adverse events there so exploitation could be of human research participants institutions local communities animals or the environment and this raises questions about how such exploitation can be avoided uh, and it could occur in two uh, for two reasons uh, one could be when research participants uh, or you know resources in the low middle middle income countries lmics are exploited intentionally for instance because research can be undertaken in the lmic that would be prohibited in the high income country so some research which may which will have regulatory uh, uh, you know uh, prohibitions in, in the developed world uh, could be done in these lmics and then exploitation can occur due to insufficient ethics awareness on the part of the researcher or the low research govern governance capacity in the host nation. So many a times uh, researchers in the developing world uh, may not have had that kind of training or exposure to ethics and uh, therefore exploitation can happen at this level as well. So uh, to give you a quick uh, case here, uh, you know, researchers in India, when they run any public health program, they know they're very aware of the fact that they have to have, they have to get informed consent from the research subjects. And they would sometimes even have the informed consent form, uh, you know, translated in the local language. But uh, the communication that happens at that point in time at the grassroots is very important. So when you go and question the research subject later on as to whether they understood what was in the informed consent form, they may not be able to you know, tell you back 
you know, what they understood out of that particular form. Uh, this is not the fault of the research subject or their literacy, you know, capacities. It is the science communication that, you know, that goes on there that has to be questioned. And um, uh, so we'll keep that in mind and move on. Um, so one of, one of the, you know, most important cases of um, ethical, ethics dumping in India is the cervical cancer screening program that was done in India. Um, so this clinical trial was conducted between 1998 and 2015. Uh, the Indian cervical cancer screening trial, it can be likened to the Tuskegee trial. This trial, which ran between 98 and 2015, was a clustered randomized control trial conducted in Mumbai, Osmanabad, and Dindukal uh, in India to study the sensitivity and specificity of using inexpensive methods of screening um, like direct visual inspection with acetic acid for detection of precancerous or cancerous cervical lesions. The trials were funded uh, by the National Institution of Health, NIH, uh, um, of the US, and uh, BMGF, and a total of 374,000 women were recruited, uh, of which 1,000 uh, uh, sorry, 141,000, which is 141,000 women were assigned to the non-screening control arm. So since it's a clinical trial, they had to have a control arm and they had assigned 1,41,000 women to the control arm. While cy a cytology from pap smear was the regular gold standard for cervical cancer screening, uh, the participants in the control arm did not receive the established standard of care protocol that is screening by the pap smear method. Uh, which was possibly because of its limited access in these rural districts. They were only, uh, but Mumbai was also part of the study. They were also dispensed with health education to identify the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer and the information on the available treatment for the same. They were followed up frequently to assess the trial proportion who had developed cervical cancer and subsequently died. This is very problematic. These participants did not receive any form of treatment uh, with 254 women dying from the control arm and 208 from the screening arm. Um, so the trials had apparent flaws in their study design with there being you know, alleged deficiency in the consent form provided in Marathi, the regional language spoken in um, Bombay. It omitted important information on further tests and interventions rendering the consent invalid. Uh, as cited by the Office of Human Research Protections, OHRP, uh, which is part of the United States investigation. Uh, furthermore, they, uh, there seemed to be a lack of maintenance of a standard of care throughout the trial. Finally, the trial recruited women from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds like homeless women, slum dwellers, who are already in, at an increased risk for developing precancerous lesions. Um, and uh, the participants in the control arm were thus, you know, they were denied human rights to avail the highest possible standard of care, which was life saving, as they were left in the dark about, you know, not getting any treatment done or, you know, the test, the pap smear test done. And this trial has garnered, you know, significant criticism and has been uh, used as an example for ethics dumping globally. Um, so you can see that. This is a Times of India article, uh, which which got published in April 21 uh, of 2014, uh, when you know this this whole trial came under the radar, and um, there are many differences that you will find for this particular clinical uh, trial, uh, but uh, definitely we have to take into account that you know this is one of a classic example of ethics dumping. And uh, you have the HPV vaccination program. Uh, this is uh, uh, the data from uh, data for this particular case is from my PhD work. I did an ethnography of the Koya uh, Adivasi community in Kamam district. Uh, so to give you a brief background, uh, the HPV vaccine evidence for impact uh, was a research program, which was a population based post licensure observational study, uh, vaccinating all the eligible girls, uh, pediatric population, uh, 10 to 14 years age group uh, in three blocks um, in Kamam, 
uh, which is a district in Telangana, which has a very high tribal population. And then Vadodara, uh, which is a district in Gujarat, which also has a high tribal population. Uh, the trial recruited about uh, 24,000 uh, adolescent girls from the states. Of, at that point in time, it was uh, Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat, uh, predominantly from the local community, the tribal communities uh, who were, I would say, differently literate and their parents or guardians um, uh, did not have any control over what happened to their children at the school because uh, many of these children were given these vaccines at their ashram shalas or the um, or the hostels hostels where they studied and uh, the headmaster of the hostel usually uh, you know, sign the consent, one single form uh, for all the children and the children were vaccinated. So during the uh, uh, during this uh, post licensure observational study, um, it was reported, especially in the news, it came out as a journalistic piece, it was reported that seven children had died. And uh, though there were se several uh, um, you know, uh, civil society activists, and even it became quite political. Uh, political leaders visited Kamam and Vadodara and uh, tried to get the investigation going. Uh, none of the postmortem reports were conclusive, and you can never, you know, say that uh, a death is because of a vaccine. Also, there were several adverse events following immunization, which were not addressed at the time of vaccination. And uh, since there was a lot of political pressure, the government of India suspended the program in between. And um, it decided to conduct an inquiry into the issues of you know, ethical violations and exploitation of the recipient pediatric population, as reported by media and the civil society groups. So one thing that I learned from my ethnographic study is that uh, the people here, very especially the mothers groups during focus group discussions would say that we are not against biomedicine. It's not like, you know, they're against development because of their ethnical identity. Uh, they said that they were open to polio vaccine and they, they were able to also say that uh, they could see the difference in the reduction in polio in their villages. Uh, it's just that they did not want any experimental studies to be conducted with their population. Uh, you, you would often find these placards in all of their um, marches saying that, why didn't you give this particular vaccine to your children in Delhi or you know, in a city? Why did you come to our community and you know, gave the vaccine to our children and therefore our children died? So they are also very valid questions. Uh, you know, you'll, one has to uh, definitely consider the recipients of these public health programs um, and we have to listen to their voices as well. And they clearly had uh, their own understanding of biomedicine uh, and they were not against biomedicine in this case. It's just that they did not like the way the program was conducted. And they said that we could have, you know, the consent form could have been given to the parents and we could have signed it rather than, you know, the headmaster signing the consent form. So these are two cases of ethics dumping that I would like to present to you today. And, um, what are the issues around all of these things? One is lack of resources or you know, insufficient expertise on ethical review. Uh, then pressure from researchers. So as uh, you know, science researchers, we want our samples, we want our research subjects. So there is this immense pressure where sometimes communication can get flawed. And then lack of active or consistent participation of the ethics committee members, uh, it is, just for the sake of you know a protocol existence, lack of recognition of the importance of the ethical committee functions, uh, no or literally poor support from the EC's institution, lack of independence. Uh, even if the if the researcher wants to conduct a study in a very ethical way, you know, following the uh, uh, following protocol as well as you know being practical about it. Um, there could be lack of independence there. Then pressure from sponsors or you know the donors, unequal treatment of applicants in review. So, um, and you know, the no brainer here is that we need to achieve equity in international research, which is like a pressing concern. Um, we, we have to build capacities, especially in, in the field of ethics. 
Uh, and exploitation in any scenario, whether of human research participants, institutions, local communities, animals or environment, raises the you know, overarching question of how to avoid such exploitation. And this can only be done, you know, there is definitely no, uh, sometimes you will not have a you know, clear understanding, a clear black and white understanding of ethics, but definitely discussions and deliberations are the key factors that will lead to uh, you know, resolving these issues. And agreed principles can be universally applied to research in any discipline or geographical area and uh, whatever the methodology you know, is being used. Uh, so that having been said, we also, um, I would like to uh, talk about like the first uh, official guidelines for the formation of the ethics committees was issued by the Indian Council for Medical Research, ICMR, in February 1980. Uh, uh, these guidelines, sorry, that was my bad, yeah. These guidelines included recommendations for membership criteria and ethical standards for review, which laid down the foundation for the establishment of ECs in India. So this happened in 1980. We have to, you know, uh, which was much earlier than all of these research that came about later. This was followed by res uh, the release of the ICMR guidelines in bioethics, which was a guidance document for research in medical epidemiology and uh, public health in the year 2000, which was further revised in 2006. Also, the India Bioscience website has an excellent compilation of the resources, resources on research ethics, and uh, please take a look at that. Um, I think uh, I would like to now open the floor for questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Savita, for that excellent presentation. Uh, it was wonderful to see examples, you know, actual case studies from not just India, but across the globe. And, and in a timeline that is actually within our own lifetimes, right? Uh, so uh, this, is, this shows how relevant it is to our times. And it's not something futuristic, uh, as sometimes we tend to imagine when we think of bioethics. Um, now, one thing that particularly caught my attention was the importance of science communication. Um, you know, for instance, sometimes uh, a scientist's own biases may come into come in their way. Uh, like, okay, this is an illiterate community. I'm not sure if I'll be able to, if they will be able to understand. Uh, it's for the greater good, so let them participate, right? So I'm sure not all, I mean, I'm sure science practitioners are not evil people, right? They are, they are many of them are well-meaning, but it's just the biases that get in the way. And it's so, so, so crucial to have a proper communication, right? So it's all comes down to proper communication, using, making good use of language, language that people understand. So what if they're illiterate? Doesn't mean that they are, uh, they are not intelligent, right? They are capable of understanding things if you just put an effort to communicate it the right way. Uh, and also uh, you highlighted the importance of having discussions time and again, because cases will come, you know, there will be new situations, new cases, new kinds of dilemmas that come into picture, uh, which you cannot always foresee. So the constant requirement of discussion about bioethical policies is extremely important for the policies to you know, evolve over time. So uh, thank you for bringing up all of these points. And uh, uh, I hope our uh, audience found it useful. Uh, we will now uh, start the Q&A session. Um, so uh, the first, um, so Savita, there is, uh, we received a few questions from the registration form. And uh, one of them uh, was about uh, asking about challenges of doing drug, drug trials in the Indian context. So if you can give us a broad overview of what kind of challenges one might face uh, if, they are, if they are to do drug trials. Uh, so, uh, if one has to do drug trials, obviously they will have to follow the standard uh, uh, operating procedures and the protocols in place, uh, follow the guidelines. Um, so, the risk of liability always falls on the person, you know, on the on the group that is doing the conducting the trial, uh, especially on account of you know improper disclosure 
to the research subject, conflict of interest. Um, so um, in some cases, the pharma might be, uh, you know, there might be a conflict of interest there. Um, and then a violation of good clinical practices, um, injuries occurring due to the test or, you know, or the trial itself. Uh, so uh, all of these liabilities would fall on the person on the sorry on the organization that is running the clinical trial uh, but at the same time um, it is very in India it's it's not very clear like sometimes uh, you have certain policies in other developed countries where you know these policies are very well uh, uh, interpreted uh, so in India that uh, clarity of interpretation sometimes we may lack, but one has to ensure that, you know, we follow all of these protocols and, uh, you know, the researcher is humane at the end of the day. And uh, many a times, uh, media has played a very important role uh, as a whistleblower. So, uh, so I, I don't know from which perspective the, the, uh, the question came through, whether, you know, there are challenges to, uh, from a scientific perspective, that there are challenges to conduct uh, clinical trials, or, you know, uh, I, I just try to understand it from my perspective as to uh, what could be the challenges. So, yeah, I hope I answered. <laughs> Vijeta, you are muted, Vijeta. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, one question is related to animal ethics. Um, you know, uh, how much, how do we make it more ethical when we know we are going to, uh, you know, use an animal for injecting a pathogen? Uh, for a scientific study. So many of uh, the audience is from a research background and I'm sure many of them use animal models. So um, yeah, what can they do about it? Okay, I can see a, a similar question again now from the audience, uh, uh, apart from the earlier one, which we already saw from the registration. So, uh, you know, it's like a million dollar question. Is it ethical or, or even moral to use animals in biomedical activities? Uh, there are no black and white answers uh, because, you know, we justify it as, as researchers, we may justify it as, you know, it is for the human good. Uh, and it has many shades of gray, I must say. Um, there, are, there is the three R concept. I don't know whether many of you might be aware of it, which is replacement, uh, reduction and refinement. Uh, which was proposed by Russell and Burke in uh, 1959. Uh, uh, their book is called The Principles of Humane Experimental Technique. Um, I think uh, I, I haven't read the book, uh, but I have used some of the material from that book uh, for my work. Uh, also, there are, uh, there are uh, I think, five Fs. Um, so we, we can follow all of these guidelines to be more humane. And um, also this whole idea of replacement, uh, we are moving towards a uh, future of synthetic biology. And uh, I think uh, our answer should be there where we can replace uh, animals at, one, at some point in time, definitely. Um, so there's one question which is related to you know, one of the cases that you pointed out where the control group didn't receive uh, a drug, right? Uh, so Harsh uh, Srivastava asks, double blind controls require the controls to receive a placebo. Um, so despite the formal, uh, you know, the informed consent, um, the control group won't receive the life-saving drug as per the scientific protocol. Uh, so is is this true and you know how can uh, you know we, we we do this more ethically so this is one one very very serious question especially with our uh, you know rcts and uh, uh, where where the research involves a control group uh, though uh, you know there is and you cannot test uh, the the idea idea behind uh, having a control group is that the efficacy of the drug cannot be tested if you don't have the control group in hand. Uh, so um, uh, th there are several debates around this, but in this particular case of the cervical cancer screening that I presented, uh, there it was more like a diagnostics 
kit that was being tested there. Uh, so uh, in this case, there was no placebo involved. So if we should look at it with more caution. We should consider it uh, case by case. Uh, and uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, um, I, I, I lead the community engagement program and I believe in community engagement and outreach and stakeholder you know, uh, engagement when you do any any sort of research um, though it may seem that your research is uh, restricted to lab work but at the same time it's very it's it's i think it's the responsibility of the scientists to also get outside of their lab to understand where you know their final product might reach so i think that will make it even more humane and you can you can deliberate on it case by case that's the answer i have for you now all right, we have a lot of questions uh, coming in. Um, so you mentioned uh, the Belmont report, right? Um, so Pragya Chobe asks, what was the significance of the Belmont report? Uh, I mean, if you could just quickly remind the audience what the report was about and uh, how was it significant and how did it influence policy? Uh, OK. Uh, so I, I just threw a couple of uh, reports at you uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, we we will go back and read up on those. Uh, yes. Uh, so it was more to do with, uh, you know, here in this case, uh, they, they try to regulate research. So, you know, the report itself tried to analyze what happened at Tuskegee. And, uh, at, and here in this case, it was one particular ethnic group of, you know, one particular, I wouldn't say ethnic, it, it's one particular group of population. And uh, who, you know, and uh, it also uh, looked at the importance of trust in research. So I would rather, uh, instead of me, you know, summarizing it, I would rather uh, encourage the audience to uh, look up these case studies and look up the reports so that you, you, you're able to read them in detail and see if, you know, if it matches with any of the dilemmas that you undergo on a daily basis. Okay. Um, can you also mention some initiatives that are in India, especially, uh, are there groups that are constantly trying to, you know, um, have discussions around bioethics? Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, bioethics in India, as I said, you know, the first guidelines of ICMR came about in 1980. So uh, the discussion about uh, medical ethics, uh, I, I should at this point in time mention the two uh, hospitals, the landmark hospitals in India, which follow medical ethics and uh, which are considered to be one of the, um, uh, you know, leading lights in this uh, area of work. Uh, one is CMC Vellore and the other is St. John's here in Bangalore. Uh, so the kind of medical ethics that they have been able to record, the dilemmas that they have recorded in all of their research um, is, uh, is worthy to go back and refer to some of the published papers. And um, it's very important to look at how on a, you know, uh, they have dealt with research ethics. And uh, also, uh, I forget the acronym now. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, the Madras University has a very uh, robust bioethics unit, uh, which has been discussing bioethics, and they have also uh, helped to integrate ethics education uh, in school programs. They've had uh, several uh, annual conferences over a period of time, uh, which they've collaborated with international partners as well. Uh, in Bombay, you have the NGO sector playing a very important important role uh, throughout, you know, the, the discourse of bioethics in India, you will find the civil society organizations playing a very, very crucial role. And uh, if you look them up, you will understand uh, the PILs that they have filed uh, in defense of vulnerable communities. And uh, the result of these PILs where, you know, where, where they would have won the cases and um, has resulted in understanding, you know, uh, how to apply bioethics in research. Uh, programs or also in public health uh, programs. It need not be a research programs. Like for instance, um, in the 90s, uh, you had uh, in, you had this case in Sassoon Hospital where a group of uh, 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 women who who uh, were 
medically diagnosed as mentally ill uh, they they were uh, the, the option there was that they should they should undergo uh, tubectomy uh, or the uteruses should be removed and uh, then a pil was filed and uh, uh, the civil society group won the case there and uh, the women uh, did not lose their uteruses so uh, so the deliberations and there were a lot of you know news articles that were written at that point in time so these deliberations are very important to follow and also to be part of to you know because it's a it's not black and white in most cases so it is very important to discuss each of these cases and understand uh, you know who has power and uh, how vulnerable is the subject in hand okay um so okay there's this one question i'm not sure if you can answer it so please feel free to uh, say no uh, but polomi datta asks uh, what is the compensation for any person or organization who violates any bioethical law so as in i guess what she meant was what's a fine i suppose um, so is there like a <laughs> defined fine? no i don't think so <laughs> it uh, so the pils have uh, it would be interesting for uh, some of you to go back and check these pil cases like you know which uh, the court must have given a verdict and uh, i think in uh, in some cases uh, where injury has happened there has been compensations uh, that has been uh, uh, you know meted out uh, but uh, there is no like set uh, we cannot say you know uh, you cannot put a price on human human life right so uh, it it's it's case by case um okay uh, so um you uh, in your phd as well you had uh, studied a case right now um uh, there's a interesting question uh, so it's from an anonymous uh, person um what happens to data gathered from unethical trials like i guess i don't know if it is still happening now or how relevant it is to the current times uh, but uh, you know once a trial has been identified as unethical or if if a researcher knows that they are doing something unethical uh, i mean what's the what do they do about it like do they publish the data are they even allowed to publish the data what happens to the data so this is a very interesting question actually in one of my uh, previous uh, you know talks i had this data for you i had this graph which actually looked at different countries and their retraction rates from uh, journals so that in itself shows you uh, you know if there was an ethical glitch when when they were conducting the research and uh, uh, more often you know you'll have you will have these papers you know they have to be retracted and um, also at the level right now with so much of uh, uh, awareness at the level of submission itself you will have to undergo uh, you know protocols where you will have to tell them that you had an institutional review board that reviewed your methodology and uh, you know the research research conduct and uh, also if there are complaints if there are any uh, whistleblowers who you know who are going to say that this you know that they were un unethical uh, practices or malpractice then even if the paper is put out uh, these days you definitely have these retractions that happen uh, and there is interesting data you can uh, you can actually access it uh, probably uh, where you know you can find out uh, the number of papers from each country that has been retracted in a year or so from science journals hmm yeah so i mean clearly retractions are happening i mean it's happening from india as well and we all know that and uh, yeah some of them must be due to some ethical issues right um, i mean not most of them but data manipulation and all but uh, yeah never thought of it in this angle that you know if perhaps the clinical study itself was not uh, ethically performed then yeah uh, but i know that for uh, the cervical cancer uh, a screening 
program they have their papers out so that's how so they had reported so the the trial itself had you know uh, the people who ran the research drivers of the trial they had reported out the number of deaths so that's how it came into the public that 254 women from the control group had died and the other group also had some deaths so uh, using the actual papers that were published uh, the you know ethical conversations around it began mm -hmm. And, and, you know, one thing that also was apparent uh, from your talk was that sometimes, um, you know, the field of bioethics is a constantly evolving one, right? So in the past, something that may have not been considered unethical in the future might be considered unethical, right? So, uh, uh, so I guess it's only from these data that uh, you can have such discussions. So I guess it's not like, uh, you know, the science practitioners are uh, doing something wrong knowingly all the time, uh, right? Sometimes it happens because of the current norms, just allow them and uh, they do it. But then as an afterthought or, you know, after the results come out and after the deaths happen and everything, it then becomes obvious that this was unethical. Um, yeah, just a thought that came to my mind. and I wanted Yeah, to that also leads me to, uh, like, I would like to talk about this here, uh, maybe as one of the final points of takeaways. Uh, I know that, you know, ethical practice uh, can be understood and can be implemented very dif differently by different groups. So it, it depends on the will of the group, right? Like it depends on how they want to uh, pursue ethics. It, it's just not for lip service. It's just not for like only talking or like following protocols and like checking off certain lists, but then actually having a, a humane concern for their subjects at hand. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the best uh, pipelines that have emerged right now in ethical practice, science practice is that, that you are constantly in touch with your stakeholders. And if there are any questions that you're not able to answer in your communication with your stakeholder, where you know the research subjects have the right to ask the drivers as to, uh, you know, if they have any questions of concern, and if the research drivers are not able to answer those questions, address those questions coherently, or, you know, they don't have empirical evidence they can bring back that question to their lab. So that happens quite a lot in uh, some of the, you know, translational work uh, across the world. And uh, there are some very nice papers that have been put out by independent evaluators of such programs. Um, so, and uh, where, uh, you know, in questions that are concerns uh, from the research subjects get, you know, get into you know, lab work, and then they go back and uh, they they communicate the answers that they have found. Sometimes they they may not find an answer, which will still remain a question. But you you will have to communicate that your research subject that you don't have answers for everything. So that level of transparency uh, and that level of feedback mechanism uh, is something that we can all strive to aim for. Though we will have challenges in terms of funding, in terms of you know. Uh, uh, getting all the papers in place, but uh, I think uh, you have some examples of best practices there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very uh, beautifully put, you know, I mean, the importance of having constant and proactive discussions, right? Like, okay, uh, even though something did not seem unethical or seemed okay, but during the process, during the interactions, when you're sincerely trying to, you know, get the informed consent, like you said, when questions arise, thinking hard on them, going back and checking and trying to, you know, evolve your own practices. I think that's that's extremely important in the field of science. Um, so we only have five minutes more, so I guess we'll just uh, wrap up uh, today's session. Um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me uh, thank Savita once again for her time and her wonderful presentation. Uh, and we had so many, so many questions coming in. Uh, and a lot of them were related to, uh, you know, what are the policies and things like that. So I think there are a lot of resources out there. And I'll request Savita to share some of the resources so that I can, I can post them on the discussion forum that we have.
have at India Bioscience so that you know people can always come back and check out those resources. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank all the audience for joining us today and I, I hope they found the session useful. Uh, please share your feedback with us. Uh, the feedback form will appear on your screens uh, right after the webinar ends. So please take out a couple of minutes. It's a very short feedback form. So please share your feedback with us. And if you wish to receive updates about our upcoming webinars, upcoming events, or the latest content uh, that has gone on our website, then subscribe to our newsletters or uh, follow us on our social media platforms. So on that note, uh, I wish everybody a very good evening and thanks for joining us. And thanks a lot, Savita. Thank you so much for having me and uh, I would just like to leave one message behind because I just real, I just looked at the group and I see a lot of researchers there. Uh, so anytime when you're going to do uh, anything to do with uh, informed consent forms, you know, consent forms per se, um, think about how informed the consent that you're getting from your research subject is. I hope it is not manufactured consent, you know, sometimes without our own knowledge, we kind of nudge and push our research subjects to certain decisions. Uh, uh, yeah, I would like to leave that message behind and uh, please, uh, you can reach out to me and uh, through Vijeta um, and uh, we can have further discussions. I'm always happy to have these discussions on ethics. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, I, I mean, check out our discussion forum on uh, India Bioscience. We will soon be having opening a discussion forum on this topic. And, um, and yeah, as time permits, if Savita can share her answers, uh, we will fill them uh, as and when she does. Okay, so uh, goodbye everyone and take care and see you next.